right, good morning. Thank you so much to Lieutenant Governor Cooney and Chief Earl Holterson for setting the stage in such an insp inspirational way. That was just incredible. Uh, someone has to follow that, and I'm that person. Uh, I'm, I'm Sean Johnson. I'm with the University of Montana's Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy. Just want to add my own personal thanks to Sarah and Anne and all the planners who pulled this off. It's incredible to see so many people in this room coming together to have these important conversations. So thanks to all of you for showing up. A uh, special shout out to my students and all the other graduate students that are here as well, being a part of these conversations and engaging with us over the next couple of days. So this is really where we start to engage in some of the conversations we want to have together. This opening panel really sets the stage for thinking about these changes that we're facing especially with respect to the changes in our climate and changes in our demographics. Our land use, where we're building, where we're growing, where we're not. I know from our planning calls that you're in for a real treat. This is a group of four really smart, really engaging people. It was actually hard for me to stop talking with them when we started talking about, well, how do all these different threads fit together? So I think this can be real, real fun for everyone. Each of them is going to share with us some of their thoughts. They spent some time putting together what they think are the key messages for us here in 20 minute chunks. So I think that'll work out pretty well. We'll go from two people, we'll take a break, we'll come back and hear from the final two, and then really spend some time engaging in discussion with each of them. So that's really your call during these, these presentations is to be thinking about well, what questions are coming up in your mind? What do you really want to drill down in and think about and discuss with them? Uh, the comfy chairs up here are for the discussion where we're going to have them kind of in, in hot, hot uh, show style respond to your questions as they come. Your job is to write down your questions on your notepads during the course of their conversations and then before or even during the Q&A, bring those up for me to share and moderate the panel discussion with them. So with that, I am absolutely delighted to introduce our, our first speaker. Leon Shatitsky comes to us from California. He's an attorney who specializes in, in water quality, water use, and watershed restoration. He worked many years at Trout Unlimited. He's taught at the University of Virginia Law School, and since 2013 has been at Stanford Wood Institute for the Environment, where he's also the director of the Water in the West program there. So perfect speaker to kick things off. He also came out a couple days early to look at our water resources. He spent Sunday at afternoon, well most of the day, in 12 degree weather, seeing how many trout he could pull out of Missouri. And I, I hear you was successful. So, with that, Leon, please come to the stage. Yeah. So I, yeah, after Sunday, I, I just about 8.30 this morning, I felt my fingers for the first time again. <laughs> experience. So I'm really, I'm really excited and honored uh, to be here. I, I, I come to Montana pretty often. I love coming here. It's a great honor uh, to be invited as, the, as a speaker at the first um, Montana Water Summit. And also, I can't say how impressed I am at, at the meeting. To have, uh, the number I heard was 300 people here um, that the organizers pulled together to talk about water in Montana. And I'm really impressed by that. I mean, we, we, in California, there are certainly 300 people who engaged in talking about the future of water in California. But I don't know that we can find 300 people we could all be in the same room together to talk about that topic <laughs> in California. So to me, that's really the impressive thing is all these people coming in the same um, room together. I just wanted to echo um, something that the uh, uh, lieutenant governor said, which was um, he, he talked about getting ahead of the curve and, and acting now. And I think the, the idea for this talk um, uh, came out of the notion of in California, which I'll talk about a little bit, California's been um, subjected to, I'm going to there's all these pictures of myself looking over my shoulder. <laughs> um, California's been subject to extreme water stress over for, for quite a few years, especially the last six or seven years, and it's created this sort of uh, combative dichotomy between fish and people, especially between the irrigators in the Central Valley and people care, who care about the uh, salmon and the coastal streams and the Sacramento and the San Joaquin rivers. And I'm convinced that this is a false dichotomy that we have enough water, and if we manage it well, there'll be enough water for fish and people. But in order to get to that point, you have to plan, and you have to get ahead, um, and you have to act now, as the Lieutenant Governor said. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is some of the extreme water stress 
that uh, California's experienced over the last six or seven years. Some of the responses to that, and, and, and the responses that, that I think and hope illustrate that the dichotomy between fish and people is false if you do the right things um, and maybe highlight some lessons um, that uh, 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 people can talk about um, uh, as the next couple of days goes on. So that's my plan for the next uh, between 20 and 50 minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, here's, a, here's a slide. This is, I love this slide uh, because it's awful. And, and what's awful about it is totally incomprehensible. But the reason it's totally incomprehensible is because it reflects reality, which is totally incomprehensible. So that's, don't worry about it too much. Just kind of soak up its horribleness. Don't worry about the details. That's the California water infrastructure system. And uh, just a quick summary of, of, of water in the state of California. Uh, we have Mediterranean climate, so most of the rain falls in the winter, virtually no rain falls in the summer. Most of the precipitation falls uh, in, the, in the northern part of the state where there's snow in the Sierras. And the state's built up over the last 100, 120 years uh, a, a huge amount of infrastructure, primarily to transport water from the north to the south, the irrigators in the Central Valley, and to the large metropolitan areas in Southern California, and to transport it from the east to the west. Um, so there's almost 40 million people in California now. There's almost uh, 9 million acres uh, of irrigated um, agriculture. Um, and uh, in, in addition to this massive infrastructure system, we have a legal system for managing water that actually, you know, compared to California's um, uh, uh, reputation as the bedrock, the, the, the hotbed of innovation, our water legal structure is actually kind of antiquated. Right? So we have uh, all sorts of little bits and pieces of the law that make it harder to do the right thing in terms of water management. So we have riparian surface water rights that coexist around with appropriate rights, uh, which makes it difficult until uh, it, it legally, and this is you know, embedded in statute, groundwater is managed separately from surface water, so the connection between groundwater and surface water is not well acknowledged legally. And until recently, the state lacked um, a statewide framework for sustainable groundwater management. So in terms of groundwater pumping in many parts of the state, there were some local exceptions, it was sort of open season. So the groundwater was treated as a limitless uh, resource that could be pumped uh, whenever uh, water is necessary. So that's sort of a, a, a backdrop. And California's been subject, always been subject to extreme weather, fires, floods, droughts. But the last six or seven years have really been, uh, even by California standards, um, kind of an extreme extreme, if I can say that. So here's, um, the, I just picked, so California's just come out uh, of a five-year drought. The drought lasted from uh, 2012 uh, to about two, sometime early in 2017. That was our long drought. That's generally acknowledged to be the worst drought in the state's history. Um, and you can sort of see here, this was a random day I picked during the drought, um, that, that uh, mo mo all, the, the entire state's in drought. And in fact, um, almost 77% of the state is in uh, severe drought or, or worse, um, and uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, extreme drought or worse. I hate this drought monitor because I don't know that this was severe, extreme, and exceptional drought. Those are from a purely linguistic perspective. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, that's a slide from the same day that, that, that the, particularly the southwest, this drought affected the southwest, and it's off the map, but Texas at the time was acutely affected by drought. And there's several interesting things about this drought. So it was four dry years in a row, followed by one average year. So 20, the 2015-2016 uh, water year was average. But what really, none of those years was the driest year uh, in the state's history. The driest year in the state's history is 76, 77. But what was really interesting about the drought and what really drove it was that it was really hot. Okay, so 2014, 2015, and 2016, uh, as of the end of the drought, were the three hottest years on record in California. And predictably, that record, uh, I don't think the data is quite out yet, but the prediction is that 2017 will now break that record, and I'll show you uh, one slide about that. So what really drove the drought um, was not so much the, the dry conditions, which it was dry, but was the uh, extreme heat that the state experienced uh, during the dry uh, period. Um, so here's just an illustration of how bad the drought was. That's Lake Orville, which is one of the uh, largest uh, reservoirs in the state, and it, it, it illustrates one problem, one thing you understand about long droughts uh, visually really well, which is large storage projects can really help in the first couple, of maybe three years of the drought, but when you get into a long drought with an extended dry period, if you have large reservoirs 
what you end up having is a lot of empty storage space. Um, so that's just, uh, I, I could have shown 30 or 40 pictures of sort of a drought horror from California, but that's Lake Oroville. But so, you, you, here we are, it's, uh, it's now um, uh, 2016, we're, we're still in drought, we're looking forward to a wet rainy season, and lo and behold, 20, uh, 16, 2017, we have not only a wet rainy season, but we go from a drought to having the wettest year on record in the state, most parts of the state, not everywhere, uh, in history, and that produced problems like this. That's the dam, that's the other end of Lake Oroville, that's the dam at Lake Oroville, which is, uh, I, I, until this dam almost failed, I didn't realize this, it's actually the highest dam in the United States. Um, and what happened was, there was so much water pouring through the spillway, there were some concrete flaws in the spillway, and the spillway essentially uh, started to crumble and it developed this huge pit, which created this uh, fantastic hydraulic, and then the hillside started to erode away, um, and they had to shift water to, if you look to the upper uh, left hand, from my perspective, uh, upper left hand, that's right, part of the picture, that uh, area up there is technically known as the emergency spillway, even though it actually, to me, it looks more ju like just the hillside. But it is, it is the emergency spillway. And when the main spillway started to fail, they started to put water over the emergency spillway. Um, and because it really it looks like just the hillside, it started to fail. Um, and they had to evacuate 188,000 people from downstream um, uh, in order, uh, out of fear that the dam would fail. And it turned out the dam did not fail. We were extremely fortunate. But it still resulted in the uh, uh, temporary dislocation of 188,000 people. So here we are. It's now the, the summer of 2017. We've experienced all these, uh, uh, this extreme drought, this extreme wet weather. So what happens in, in the summer of 2017 is it gets really, really hot. And 2017 turns out to be the hottest summer in California's history. So we have a wet year. All this vegetation grows up. Then you have a really hot summer. It dries out all the vegeta vegetation. And then in the fall, what happened is the fires just started to explode all over the state because there was so much vegetation and it was so dry. Um, and there was the Napa fires in the early uh, uh, part of the fall where more than 40 people died. Uh, we had a really dry fall, so the fire season extended, and we had a bad fire in Mount Santa Barbara in December. And uh, those fires uh, were then followed by the late onset of the rainy season, which produced, because the hillsides were denuded, tremendous uh, mudslides that killed more than 20 people. Um, so it was just sort of one uh, extreme after another. <laughs> and the, you know, the question is, uh, so here's just a quick illustration. Uh, and so all these catastrophes uh, are now followed by, uh, here, we, here we have it again, more drought in California. So just focus on the bottom of the graph. The red line is the driest year in the cataclysmic five-year drought. The blue line is our current year, and that's a little bit out of date. This is from last week, and we did get some snow at the end of the week, so that should be a little bit better. And then the line at the bottom is the driest year in the state's history. So we're, we went from the wettest year to right back to conditions that were drier than at any point during the cataclysmic uh, five-year drought. Um, and there's the um, illustration. Um, what we're really starting to realize um, in California <laughs> is that really cool weather is a thing of the past, right? So this is the black line in the middle are average temperatures, uh, and then the, the red lines on top are, are, are exceedances above the mean, and the blue lines are cool years. So, re so red lines are hot years, blue lines are cool years, and you can see that the number of blue lines below the, lo below the middle line are really <coughs> almost uh, disappearing. And it turns out that's, uh, in fact, the primary driver of drought in California now. It used to be that if you had a dry year, there was a 50% chance that it would be cool and a 50% chance that it would be warm. And the dry, cool years, there was a pretty good chance that you wouldn't have a drought. In the dry, warm years, there was a very high chance that you would have a drought. Um, and they looked at this issue, uh, there were some climate change researchers at Stanford who have looked at this and concluded that in the future, we have basically a 100% chance of having a warm year when we have a dry year. And that phenomenon alone will drive drought frequency in California's future. The frequency of droughts will go way up just because uh, of the temperature. So one thing we know about climate change is it will get warmer and that will make droughts worse. The other really uh, close uh, correlate issue is um, that we will have less snow. So this is the, the, the snowpack with the red line being average. 
And you can see uh, in 2015, that was our uh, uh, lowest snowpack, which was 13% uh, as of uh, March 1st. That was the year, I don't know how much of you follow the news in California. I know how much people in Montana think that everything in California. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, the snowpack disappeared by the end of the water year. So I, Governor Brown went up to check the snowpack, and there was the area that should be covered with feet of snow was bare ground. And we totally lost our snowpack by the spring. And you can see this year, we're just a little bit better, 23% uh, uh, of normal. Um, so uh, the other thing we know is that because it'll be warmer, we'll have less snow. We'll have more rain, and then the snow that we have will melt uh, earlier. And that produces several problems, one of which is the problem illustrated by the Lake Oroville slide, which is we have to cope with a different, drought, a different flood regime. We'll get floods earlier than we used to because of the rain and because of the snow melt, which is problem one. And problem two is the snow melt won't be there later in the summer, and we'll get lower uh, uh, late summer flows and less water availability um, later in the summer. Okay, so just one catastrophe after another in California. And actually, except, except for the horrible tragedies where people died, the states, um, y y you know, the states actually managed pretty well. Despite the worst drought in history, the agricultural economy only got, took about a 5% hit. Cities did fine. Um, and and uh, so you can ask yourself how they did that. And so why is it that California survived this apocalypse? Or to put it in Montana terms, you can ask yourself, why is it that even more people from California haven't moved to Bozeman? Um, <laughs> and really, they, 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 the state did, the three things happened that made the state get through all of this. So the first thing is um, that the agricultural economy survived by pumping huge amounts of groundwater. So groundwater pumping is uncontrolled. The groundwater levels, especially in the southern Central Valley, plummeted, but the agricultural producers got by by pumping lots of groundwater. Now that's not sustainable, and the state now has a groundwater management act, so that's gonna have to change. The second thing that happened, which is really interesting, is cities got even more efficient. So cities have gotten more efficient over the years, and even though the population in California are um, exploring sort of the next wave of technological water efficiency. So the first wave was um, uh, efficient plumbing fixtures, but now more and more cities in California are recycling their wastewater. So a lot of cities in California and the coast, they dump their sewage into the Pacific Ocean. More and more, it's been going on for a long time, but it's dramatically increasing. They're taking their sewage wastewater and they're using it either to recharge aquifers, they use it for irrigation, and they also use it, uh, they're now exploring direct potable reuse. But the third thing that happened is really the environment just took a huge hit. So, so farmers did all right, cities did all right, but the environment kind of got crushed. So it, it, it got way less water than it would get in a normal year. And uh, runs of salmon, runs of steelhead, other aquatic species, uh, 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 which were already on, you know, kind of wobbly, it got even worse. So right now, something like only 18% of, of fish species in California, native fish species, have stable populations. All the rest are either vulnerable, listed as endangered, or already extinct. And even though the droughts, uh, we had a, a normal year followed by a wet year, salmon runs in the state are still way down. They've just been crushed by the drought, and the state had to cancel the commercial uh, salmon fishing season. So the, I talked about the three things that the state, uh, the groundwater pumping and the impact that didn't get through the drought, and the groundwater pumping and the impact on the environment obviously aren't sustainable. But there are pockets where really people use innovative water management uh, to um, break down this fish versus people dichotomy. And, and, and the environmental flows and human water use were both able to make it through the drought intact. And there are four quick lessons from those, and I'll illustrate them with a couple of examples as I finish up here. So one lesson is the importance of data. In order to make the right decisions about cutting back water use during a drought and balancing wet use years with dry use years, you have to have good data about water use and the connection between water use and stream flow. The second is you have to plan for drought. And by plan for drought, you have to decide what your objectives are during the drought and come up with specific actions to meet those objectives. And I'll talk about that more in a second, too. The third lesson that's illustrated by these examples is conjunctive use, especially uh, in local storage, but especially local groundwater storage, is an incredibly powerful water management tool. So if you recharge your aquifers during wet years and lean on them during dry years, you can actually do a huge amount to survive a drought. And the final thing is water transfers can play a key role. There's been a lot of talk in California over the last few years about water markets broadly, and that's fine, but whatever your water transfers are, whatever your water market is, it has to have a goal. Um, and if you have water transfers with a specific goal, they can be incredibly powerful. 
So I'm going to illustrate those lessons, I hope, uh, with two examples. One is the, the Yuba River, um, and the other is the Russian River. So the Yuba River um, is a tributary of the Feather River, which flows into the Sacramento River, which then flows into the Bay Delta. And the Bay Delta is sort of one of California's water supply hubs. The Sacramento and the San Joaquin come together, and water is pumped out of the Delta and shipped south. So it's a critical, critical uh, water supply hub. Um, and it has, the Yuba has uh, a, a, a large amount of agriculture, mostly perennial crops. I'm sorry, mostly annual crops, including rice uh, and a variety of other crops. It has three runs of anadromous fish, a steelhead, and two runs of Chinook salmon. One of the runs of Chinook salmon are listed under the Endangered Species Act. And because of those listed fish, the Yuba's went through many years of water conflict. So in the 1990s, the State Water Resources Control Board, the regular authority in California, uh, was starting to push for higher flows on the Yuba River for these fish. And eventually, in the early 2000s, the board ordered the Yuba County Water Agency, the primary water manager and the owner of that uh, uh, New Bullard's Bar uh, Reservoir, uh, to meet minimum flow targets on the Yuba. And a variety of water users sued to challenge those minimum flow targets, and that uh, the basin was faced with enormous water conflict. But what came out of that conflict was a tremendously powerful agreement which the parties entered into in 2007, which is called the Yuba Water Accord. And it has a lot of amazing stuff in it, but for purposes of today, it had an incredible drought management plan. And the, the Yuba River Accord identified seven different types of water years hydrologically, from the very wettest to the very, very driest. And it laid out specific measures that the uh, uh, water users and water managers would employ to meet the, the, the flow targets, that are different flow targets for each year, and specific measures, including water use reductions and other measures, which I'll talk about in a second, to meet those flow targets. So they have really good uh, planning, which is what, what, you know, lesson, I actually took this out of order, that's lesson two. Lesson one is, because of all the litigation, they had really good data connecting uh, uh, water use and stream flows. So they were able to know if we take actions X, Y, and Z, people will have this much water and the river will have this much water. So water users could actually plan for the amount of water they would have during the drought and act accordingly. So really good data and really good planning. But the other thing that really made it work is they had a really aggressive program to recharge their aquifers. So during wet years, the Yuba County Water Agency uh, would aggressively recharge aquifers that had previously been depleted. They got them back up to normal levels. So now during a drought, water users uh, in the area can turn to groundwater if surface water is not available to irrigate their crops and to uh, provide water uh, for municipalities. So they can switch conjunctively between surface water and, and, and uh, groundwater depending on the hydrologic conditions. So groundwater recharge and conjunctive use were incredibly powerful. And then the final thing is, what, what the Yuba County Water Agency does during an extreme drought is it transfers water downstream to south of Delta water users. So it's fortunate to be upstream of that hub, and agricultural producers who really, really need water during drought buy water from the Yuba County Water Agency. So that means it flows all the way through the lower river, uh, Yuba River, providing flows for those fish, meeting the minimum flow targets, downstream to the Sacramento, downstream to the Delta, gets pulled out of the Delta and, and, and sent south to the, to the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and that provides an alternative source of income for farmers in the Yuba Basin when uh, conditions are extremely dry. So, so good data, good planning, um, uh, aggressive conjunctive use and aquifer recharge, and um, uh, uh, strategic use of water transfers. Now, the Russian River is just a, a, an illustration of the totally other side of the coin. So the Russian River is a coastal river flows into the Pacific Ocean. It also has endangered runs of anadromous fish. It has threatened the run of coho salmon. It does not have good data. It does not have a good water management plan. What happens during the drought is there are four tributaries of the Russians that are identified as a really good habitat for coho, four priority tributaries. And the phenomenon that they experience during the drought is during the summer, these tributaries would literally dry up. And juvenile coho would be stuck in these isolated pools, not be able to migrate downstream, and subject to an extremely high level of, of mortality. So the first thing that the state did in response, and, and NOAA Fisheries did in response to this problem, is they ordered water conservation in the basin. And they didn't have good data. They, they didn't know what the benefits of the water conservation would be. So in the summer of 2014, the water conservation didn't cause these streams to flow. The coho were still isolated. And people were literally taking buckets of fish, 
walking them downstream and dumping them into the main stem of the river, literally by hand, transporting these fish downstream. So the following year, the situation was even worse. In 2015, the flows of these tributaries were 10% normal. Uh, and again, coho were being stranded. So the state issued two emergency orders, and you can see what the problem is from the title of them. The first emergency order was an informational order, and the second emergency order was a conservation order. So the information order was to collect data from riparian and groundwater users in the basin because the state didn't know where the riparian diversions were and where the wells were and how much water they were using. So they had no idea what actions to take because they didn't know where the water use was. And in fact, they didn't get that data pursuant to the order until January of 2016 when the emergency was over. The second thing they did was the conservation order, which was just sort of a municipal water conservation order that ordered people to stop watering their lawns on certain days, stop washing their cars, and things like that. And again, they didn't know what the benefits of that conservation would be, and so the crisis continued in the summer of 2015. And this goes back to, that this is not really water transfers, but it's sort of creative, uh, voluntary solutions. The only thing that worked during this whole crisis is state and NOAA fisheries worked with individual water users that had local storage. So it was literally people who were pumping groundwater and putting it in water towers, putting it in small reservoirs, and they would run pipes or hoses from those uh, local storage and, and, and run the water into these tributaries, and they were able to put just enough water in these tributaries, small quantities of water, like half a CFS, one CFS, to allow the juvenile coho to migrate downstream. So the, 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 the planning failed, the data failed, the emergency orders failed, and the only thing that worked were these sort of quirky, creative uh, voluntary solutions. So that's sort of two dichotomies for these two lessons about um, what to do in, uh, uh, in a drought. And just going back to the lieutenant governor's words, get ahead of the curve, act now. This, this collecting of data and the, and, and the planning for drought are, are absolutely hypercritical. And you really have to think about what you're going to do in the drought, what your goals are, and how you're going to meet those goals, and get information to make those decisions which is really illustrated by these two uh, examples. There's just two other things, um, my time's up, that I just wanted to flag um, for, for potential discussion during the question and answer session. One is, 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 is one thing that's happening in California, which I mentioned briefly before, is cities are really pushing to sort of the next level technologically of, of water use efficiency. So recycling of wastewater is, is just skyrocketing, and programs to get rid of lawns are really increasing during these periods of shortage. And cities, which were already pretty efficient, are really getting uh, dramatically more efficient. So that's a happy story. The sadder story, which is just a really critical issue, is the linking of uh, water management and uh, land use planning. So most of the state, the land use planning is totally separate from water management, so development can outstrip available water supply. But there are examples, really extreme examples, of where that's not true that people can look at. And so, the last thing I would just mention is there are places in California, the, most, uh, the biggest example being Monterey, the Monterey Peninsula, where Carmel is in Monterey, the aquarium, where they literally, their water supply is capped. It's, it's a coastal uh, city, there's a small coastal watershed. They can't take very much water out of the Carmel River because of, of steelhead. They've got a limited amount of groundwater. They'll, they're building a desal facility, but, but, but they have a fixed amount of water to cope with growth. So in Carmel, if you want to build a new house, you have to retire water use somewhere else in order to be able to acquire water supply for that house. So that's an example of where land use planning is really dramatically, somewhat draconianly linked uh, with, uh, with water management. And because that's not true in the west of the state, there's a possibility of development outstripping water supply. But there are examples of where you can tightly link water management and land use planning in a way that makes them uh, much more harmonious. So I just flagged that as a potential issue uh, for discussion when we have our panel. And again, thank you all for, for having me. It's just been a real Thank you. All right, we're off to the races. Thank you so much, Leon. That was a nice distillation of some lessons from California. I also want to thank you for helping Californians stay in California. <laughs> nice uh, one of the other things, one of the other co-benefits co of getting people together in a room like this is getting to be colleagues from your own campus. And my next speaker is a, prof a professor at the University of Montana, where I also work, but we haven't had a chance to meet yet. 
So let me uh, introduce Marco Manetta. He's an associate professor of hydrology and hydrologic modeling. His research focuses on water and energy flows in the landscape, at the landscape and the regional scale. So I think it's really pertinent to the conversation we're having this morning. Currently, he's also working with DRC and others to develop new models and analyses that can help us understand and explore the impact of drought on Montana's water resources and especially the agricultural community. So here's Marco. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you for coming, and I want to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, share with you the uh, research that uh, my collaborators and I do uh, related to uh, Montana's water and climate and uh, the impact uh, on agriculture. Hopefully, I'll present some results that will be useful for uh, the discussion that we are going to have in the next couple of days. Uh, so, uh, Montana's um, agriculture. Uh, or Montana's climate uh, impacts uh, Montana's livelihoods, Montana's agriculture, Montana's environment, Montana's economy, like anywhere else in the world. It's important to uh, establish uh, how um, climate is, uh, is going to be changing, and uh, the current consensus of the uh, scientific community is really nicely summarized in the uh, Montana climate assessment. And I want I want to point you out to this document. It was released last year that uh, puts together a summary of how the community views the changes that uh, Montana's climates have had in the, in the past 30 to 50 years and how we're anticipating this climate to change through the end of the century. And how these uh, changes in climate are going to impact our water resources, our agriculture, and our forestry. So the interesting thing about this document is that it is not a scientific paper, it's not a technical document, it is a document that is driven by the needs of stakeholders, so it's designed to help uh, stakeholders that make decisions based on, uh, on climate make better decisions, and uh, so the uh, document is designed to provide uh, the information that they need and disseminate in a way that they can, they can reach it, so it's a, it's a really nice read very accessible, so I recommend that you guys go. It's a, it's a freely available online from that from that link here. Uh, the other important thing about that document is that it is a consensual document with participation from all the major uh, scientific and uh, organization groups here in the state. So it's a it's the it, the climate assessment represents the state of the art. Uh, and uh, for this, it's a foundational document that we use and I use in my research. And I'm going to give a few of the key messages uh, of this document so you guys uh, get calibrated to uh, what, we, what has been happening with climate. So one of the things that is pointed out in the, uh, in the, in the assessment is that because of the position of Montana straddling the, uh, the um, Rocky Mountains and the Northern Plains, there's a very strong climate west to east for Mediterranean. The west has lots of oceanic influence from the, from the Pacific, and the east has a much stronger continental, continental uh, climate. So um, the uh, annual air temperatures in, uh, in uh, western Montana are like in the low 40s. Uh, in eastern Montana, they are a little higher. They're a little low, but the important thing here is that uh, in eastern Montana, Winters are way colder. Their, their average temperatures for the winter are in the, uh, in the low 20s and high teens. And the summers are very hot in the high 60s re relative to uh, the climate in uh, western Montana. So western Montana has much milder winters. Uh, the banana bed of the peninsula. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, in the low 20s and it has much milder summers. So they, uh, the oscillation within the year is not as intense. So western Montana has uh, oceanic influence to some extent. Eastern Montana is a very strong uh, uh, continental climate. Something happens with uh, with uh, precipitation. There is a very strong declining annual precipitations as we're moving east, and the oceanic influence fades. So in Western Montana, uh, we get an average between 20 and 30 uh, inches of rain a year, and this declines as we go down towards Eastern Montana until we get to uh, the uh, counties close to the Dakotas and uh, where they barely get 12 or 13 inches. And of course it has very strong implications on uh, how um, 
farming gets exposed to precipitation shortfalls when they, when they happen. So, um, uh, so this is the, uh, this is the um, uh, characterization of the climate. I'm going to characterize what uh, has been happening, and again, this is not modeling, this is what the data says. This is what we are observing from our, from our measurements. Uh, in the last 65 years, we've seen that average annual temperatures in all the regions in Montana, northwest, southwest, all the way to the uh, eastern part, has been increasing at a rate of between a third of a degree and half a degree every decade. <laughs> so uh, there's a generalized increase, which is in line with uh, what has been happening in all Western, Western US. And what we see, well, what we're going to see is that this increase is not the same spread equally along the year. What we're, gonna, what we're seeing is that summers are seeing a much stronger increase than, uh, than other seasons. So the growing season is seeing a faster increase in, uh, in temperatures that, are, uh, that has implications for agriculture. Something that is not so clear in the climate assessment because of the way they aggregate data is that um, we're observing a decline in precipitation during the summer months. So now that's, there's something very interesting here because if you look at the annual total volumes of precipitation falling the state, there's not a, really a very important change. So the precipitation stays constant, but there is a redistribution of how precipitation is uh, distributed within the year. So we're going to see that the amount of precipitations are increasing in the spring, and this is compensated by a decline in precipitation during the summer months, during the growing season, which is when we the precipitation the most for, for agriculture. We're also seeing, and this is, this is true for the entire western US, except for half in the northern plain and eastern Montana, where we might see an increase. We're also seeing a decline in the number of rainy days in, in western Montana. So precipitation is getting, uh, it falls now in less, in a, in a smaller number of days. And the number of days with no waiting rain is increasing, which has tremendous in, impact for forest fires and for um, for agriculture. Uh, so um, those observations that we have on our data lend credibility to the projections that we're seeing from the models for the mid-century horizon, which is the horizon that I believe is important for decision making. Uh, what we see here are the changes for all the regions in Montana and for all the months uh, in, uh, in the year of uh, average temperature for the period 2042. 2017. And uh, tan colors, those tan colors indi indicate an increase. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are seeing an increase over all the, uh, we're, we're, we're going to expect an increase over an entire year, but uh, the increase, it's more intense during the growing season from uh, June through, uh, through September. So that's where we're going to have the, uh, the highest increase. And uh, the, these two graphs indicate two different uh, climate scenarios. The RCP 8.5 is what we call business as usual. This would be the warming that we would expect if the emissions in the world stay at current, at current levels. And the scenario on top is a milder scenario if we curve our emissions a little bit such that by the end of the century the additional heat that we're getting from the atmosphere is 4.5 watts per square meter. But the idea here is that even, even when we curve we're our emissions, we're going to still see an increase in temperature and still the increases are going to be most pronounced during the summer months. The same thing, something similar or something that relatively similar happened for precipitation. I mentioned that precipitation is going to be um, um, uh, um, uh, pretty much about the same over the entire year. Uh, but it's going to be a redistribution. We're going to see a decline of precipitation in both scenarios during the, uh, the growing season, and we're going to see an increase. Tank colors is a decline, and blue colors an increase, and we're going to see a, a redistribution of water towards the spring. But now, because temperatures are increasing, we're expecting to see, instead of snow, uh, an increase in the amount of, uh, uh, of rain in, a, in the spring season. So those changes, uh, so um, the interest in, uh, in, my, in my research now is how those changes are going to impact agriculture and uh, Montana's, Montana's economy and food security. And what we've seen is that uh, in spite of those changes that we're observing, Montana's agriculture is actually very resilient. And we've seen that crop yields 
have been uh, increasing, uh, strongly fueled by uh, um, technology and better management, better seeds. So we see that winter wheat, we're getting roughly three additional bushels per acre uh, each decade. For barley, uh, every, every 10 years we get an additional five bushels. But, um, so the blue line is the, is the state average. The gray line is the, is the uh, changes in each of the counties in the, in the state that are growing those products. And what we see is that there is an increase in the variability between the counties. So some counties are doing better, some counties are going to do it less, less good. So identifying what are the counties that are doing less good is good to, uh, to start informing mitigation strategies. The, the uh, exception to this increase is alfalfa. Alfalfa has not seen an increase over time in the production, but it's seen that there is a, uh, a divergence in the, in the productivity of the different counties. So we're interested in looking at this uh, as a way to assess how farmers react and allocate uh, land when they are uh, faced with a precipitation shortfall. So I'm going to give you an example of how to do an analysis to evaluate the sensitivity that farmers have to a changing climate. So let's see if I, uh, if I can see. So the red, if I can explain what we see here. The red line is the, uh, uh, is the uh, agricultural, uh, the alfalfa production, and this is yield times acreage. For a specific county, Mr. Montana, it doesn't matter. What we're seeing is the anomaly. Zero is the production that we get, uh, is the average production, the historical average production. Positive values is more production than average, negative values less than average. The blue line is the anomaly in precipitation. Zero is like the historical precipitation. Positive numbers is more than average, negative numbers less. When the anomalies are accumulated for one month, this is the time scale, for March, month three. And we see that the, the both lines are correlated. We can accumulate the anomalies for six months in March, and there is no correlation. We can accumulate it for 15 months, there's no correlation. We can try April, one month, we can go cycling, and what we see is there is a moment where uh, the an an anomalies in precipitation explain the anomalies in alfalfa production for this county. This is very interesting because we say we are calculating here the inertia that the agricultural system has to precipitation shortfalls. What it's telling us is that farmers will start reacting not when they see an anomaly of one or two months. The anomaly needs to be accumulated over 10 months at least for farmers to start reconsidering and a change in production. And it has to happen for this county early in the growing season. So we can do, uh, this graph here shows what we've seen, uh, but for the entire, um, so we have here all the time scales, all the months uh, of accumulated anomaly and all the months in the year. And the colors, as they are getting dark, indicates a more agreement between the precipitation uh, anomalies and the production anomalies. And what we see is that anomalies for these counties in eastern Montana from January to April don't really matter, but there's a sharp increase where anomalies start really mattering a lot, and this is, uh, of course, in the growing season, months five through seven, but that the response is for anomalies accumulated between nine and 11 months. So you need to accumulate an anomaly this long for farmers to start uh, reallocating land or for production to be impacted. So we've done this analysis for all the countries, and what we observe is that Eastern Montana has this very clear pattern uh, of sensitivity, but as we're moving west, the pattern disappears. And when we move to uh, the mountain region in Western Montana, we see that farmers are much more decoupled from uh, precipitation variability. They are not as tied to the precipitation cycles that farmers in Eastern Montana. So they are much more resilient. So uh, we can do a little bit of a, an additional analysis and transform this information into a precipitation sensitivity factor. And as the number gets bigger and the colors get greener and yellower here, we see more sensitivity. And what we see is a gradient. As we're moving east, the colors get yellower and greener, indicating higher sensitivity to precipitation variability. So those farmers here are more exposed to drought cycles or to, uh, or to precipitation shortfall than farmers here. Another interesting thing is the uh, month for which they are sensitive. And here in Western Montana, the anomalies have to go through month life, through the entire growing season, to see changes in the uh, in the in uh, in the in, in production. Eastern Montana, they start seeing changes in the production when when the anomalies happen earlier in the season. But the important thing is that 
inertia, the time scale. Southwestern Montana requires the shield of colors is required more months of accumulated anomalies for farmers to start reacting. Eastern Montana requires less months, has less inertia. They, they are much more variable and much more tight. And of course, we've been, uh, this is one of alpha. And this pattern here is awfully close to the patterns that we see in irrigation, of course. This is where alfalfa irrigation is accumulated in southwestern Montana. Irrigation decouples farmers from precipitation variability, which is, of course, something that is going to help them cope better with, uh, with, uh, with precipitation cycles. The other interesting thing is that this pattern looks very similar to the institutional constraints that we see in better regions in Montana. And a colleague of mine, Brian, uh, Chaffin has been looking at what regions have more institutional constraint to uh, water development, and this includes surface water rise, groundwater closures, in stream flows, and we see that they're accumulated here. Those farmers do better and are more resilient. We don't know yet if it is because of the institutional constraints or in spite of them. This is something that hopefully we'll be discussing here. Finally, I want to point out to a very um, Important piece of work that uh, we're doing now in collaboration with the NRC and the Montana Climate Office to put together all the information that we have and uh, generate simulation capabilities to anticipate, to be ahead of the curve, on how um, climate variability and how changes in agricultural markets and changes in policy, in water policy, are affecting our water resources and uh, and anticipate how farmers are going to react to those changes. So uh, what we're seeing here is a snapshot of the, of the uh, interface of our model with all the uh, hydrologic network in Montana. Each of those dots, we can observe the stream flow. We have information from the snow tails. We can calculate the amount of evapotranspiration and the different climate scenarios. But the interesting thing is that we can click in any county and the model will simulate how farmers are going to allocate land and water. And here, for instance, for uh, Ravalli County, we're going to see that the, uh, farmers in the irrigation district there are going to allocate this amount of, of land to alfalfa, this to other irrigated crops, this amount of farmers are going to be impacted. So and in that case, um, during the baseline scenarios, farmers have about 2,300 acre feet. They don't use it all, they're not water binding. We can calculate how much water you can ask them, how much uh, dollars would you be willing to pay for an additional unit and they're going to say zero because I had the water and I didn't use it. But if, say, you can simulate a 30% reduction in the water that you make available to farmers in that county, or 50%, two scenarios, and we see now that the water available is reduced and the water used by farmers now is all they have. So now water is binding. Through our model we can calculate the opportunity cost of this water. We can say, yeah, you know, like, during this 30% reduction, Farmers are losing $9 for not having an additional unit of water. We can also calculate the impact, the percent loss in net revenues with respect to the baseline. And what we see is that as we increase the uh, reduction, of course, the value of water increases. And we can calculate this for all the counties in Montana and perhaps help inform water markets or, or other action. But we can also calculate the impact that different scenarios are going to have in, uh, in Montana's uh, agricultural economy. In, in terms of impacts in, in, uh, in reductions in net revenues. So, uh, to uh, summarize, um, temperatures we have been increasing in Montana and will continue to increase. Uh, the increases will be more, more pronounced during the growing season. Uh, precipitation has increased in the spring and has decreased during the, uh, the growing season, even though the total annual amounts will stay about the same. We're going to see longer periods without waiting green, especially during the growing season. In spite of it, agriculture, agricultural yields remain very strong, fueled by uh, better practices and better technology. So we've seen uh, an increase in our agricultural productivity. But Eastern Montana is uh, much more exposed to, um, to precipitation variability than Western Montana. So uh, um, we can uh, map what are the hot spots and the sensitive spots that might require attention to, uh, to uh, help farmers uh, become more resilient. So Western Montana exhibits more resiliency. And then we are developing those new remote sensing based hydroeconomic tools that will allow us further insight, and will permit us simulation capability to gain insight into the impact that climate change will have on Montana's water resources and Montana's agriculture.
Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Marco. I think that responded to Leon's call for good data to inform our discussion. Uh, the quiz on those maps will be right after the break, and so be prepared for that. We are now taking a quick break. Please uh, enjoy stretching your legs and come back quickly. We're going to start back up at 10.10.